Today's message is taken from Luke chapter 6, a passage that I will be reading presently, but uh, I I will include that in my, my sermon this morning. Kim and I live in a nice little brick house just off Egypt Road in Montclair. Our mailing address is Phoenixville, but Phoenixville is actually in Chester County on the west side of the Schuylkill River, and we live on the east side, which is Montgomery County. We've lived there now for 13 years, and the strangest thing has happened. The house has gotten filled up with with stuff. I put up some nice shelves in the basement, but nature hates a vacuum, and it didn't take long for them to be filled to overflowing. Now, some of the stuff is mine. That's the good stuff. You know, appliances that no longer work that I want to take apart someday, or, you know, just, just my stuff. And, and Kim has some of her stuff there. And there is also stuff that belongs to our girls. Oh, Dad, this is important stuff but not so important they wanted to take it with them when, when they moved, and so we are, we are left with it. And now, with four grandchildren, that's a whole new category of stuff that they might need for a school project, or they might grow into, or might want to play with when, when, when they come visit. And then there is the stuff that came when our parents broke up housekeeping. Of course, I said, oh, we don't need all this. But you know, it it might be something that the girls would want. Maybe maybe we better pack it up and and take it home and let them look at it. And they say, well, gee, that's nice, Dad, but you know, the the car is full of car seats for the children. We, We can't take it today. Let us think about it. And one day, you know, one special day, we'll, we'll suddenly decide we, we might like it after all. But you know, Kim and I are in good company. I have read that the average American home simply has too much stuff in it, and we don't know what to do with it all. There's an old saying attributed to Benjamin Franklin that you really need to have either a fire or move about every five years to keep ahead of it all. We cram things into closets. We stuff things under beds. We fill our attics and our basements. Uh, Some folks even buy those little extenders to lift up the bed higher so you can stuff more under it. Some folks will rent one of those storage units to hold the excess. And I've I've read that the self-storage industry in the United States is a $38 billion a year industry. Most of us store things away because we think that somehow they're valuable to us, or, or maybe we'll use them again someday, or, or often there's some sort of sentimental attachment, or, or sometimes we, we stuff things away because we're just feeling too overwhelmed to deal with it at that particular moment. And so we stuff it away in the attic or the basement or under the bed, and all too often we we forget about it. And there it sits in the dark collecting dust. Of course, different cultures have different ways of dealing with junk. The country of Japan takes garbage collection and recycling very seriously. In In some cities, the citizens are required to separate out all of the recyclable material and bag it in color-coded bags to ensure that it gets recycled correctly. And even beyond that, 
every citizen has to use see-through garbage bags with their name on it uh, before they put their, their trash out to the curb for, for pickup. And uh, this policy helps to ensure that the ever watchful homeowners association can report you to the local recycling center if you dispose of your trash improperly. In our Bible passage of, of the morning, Jesus talks about the things that we store, but the things that we store in our hearts, our beliefs, our prejudices, our attitudes, our habits, our grudges, our emotions, but he doesn't speak of them as, as trash or junk. Rather, he speaks of them like seeds in a garden. And these seeds don't lie dormant. According to Jesus, the, the things we store up in our hearts start to grow. And they push through to the surface of our lives. And they are revealed through our, our words and our attitudes and our actions. They can't remain hidden. They must be expressed. Reading from Luke 6, 43 to 45, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick fruit figs from a thorn bush, or grapes from a briar, a good person brings good things out of the good that is stored up in their heart. And an evil person brings evil things out from the evil that is stored up in their heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Well, what was Jesus trying to teach his disciples with these colorful verses? Well, first he was saying that every life bears fruit. And your life will influence the lives of everyone around you. You cannot hide what is inside, or at least not for long. A bad character will show through and influence all those around it and a good character will do the same thing. Susan Matisse was attending a dog training workshop in Salt Lake City, and in this workshop, the instructor stated that a dog's disposition can be tested by how it responds to its owner's pain. If its owner falls down and pretends to be hurt, a dog with a bad disposition won't particularly care, but a good dog will show concern, rush over, you know, and whimper, might even lick the owner's face. Matisse decided to test her two dogs, and she says that while she was eating pizza in her living room, she stood up and dramatically clutched her heart and screamed and collapsed back on the couch. And how did her dogs respond? Her dogs watched her fall, looked at each other, then raced to the coffee table and ate her pizza. <laughs> well, maybe dogs can't be faulted for being competitive when it comes to, to pizza, but we humans choose our character by the things that we value and we prioritize. Followers of Jesus are called to live fruitful lives. And in John 15, Jesus said, I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Your character isn't just contagious, it's lasting. Your deepest beliefs and values and priorities will live on in your children and your grandchildren, in your business, in your community, in your church, long after you are gone. Jesus knew this, 
So he made it clear that love and forgiveness is the seed that will grow lasting good fruit. What you store up in your heart determines your fruit. It determines your impact in life. If you think of your heart as having two compartments, one side is a bank account, the other is the trash can. And you choose which thoughts and emotions and priorities and attitudes you want to save in the bank account and which ones you don't want to have in your heart. And those are the ones that go out with the trash. Will you hold on to God's word or will you hold on to some co-worker's rude comments? Will you hold on to anger and resentment or will you throw it away and free yourself and the offender from your judgment? The things that you choose to keep and which go into the bank account will increase. They will build up interest. So choose wisely. In his letter to the Philippians, the apostle Paul was concerned about an argument between two prominent church members. And after urging them in his letter to settle their differences peacefully, he gave some advice to the whole church on how to keep peace and unity. He wrote in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or or praiseworthy, think about such things. Why do we think on these things? Well, so we can store them in our heart and so that we may bear good fruit. Finally, a, a fruitful life consists of bearing fruit for the sake of others. Our fruit is produced for the benefit and the nourishment and the edification of other people. To be a follower of Jesus, we we cannot just be self-absorbed and self-contained and solitary. We must bring the goodness out of our storehouse and and share it with others. When when Kim and I first moved to this area, we, we agreed that we would bank at the TD Bank, right down on the corner, for the very simple reason that it was right on my way home and I could deposit our checks without making a special trip. But you know, one of the downsides with banks is the way they're always moving their tellers from branch to branch. By the time I finally get to know them and the ages of their children and what they've decided to to name their puppy, bang, next week they're off to some other branch and I have to start with some new teller that I I, I have no idea uh, about. But I met a teller by the name of Vashti, which, which rung a bell. That was the name of the Queen of Persia from the book of Esther. And Vashti turned out to to be a Coptic Christian who had come from Egypt. Now, sometimes when people ask me where where I'm from, I I kind of half-jokingly say that Erie is a very nice place to be from uh, for the simple reason that the winters are so long and so hard up there on, on the Great Lakes. Uh, For months at a time, the sky is gray, slate gray, and every day it seems to be snowing or sleeting or causing some sort of uh, of misery. For every inch we get down here in Devon, Erie gets a foot, and uh, it, it is just a nice place to be from. But the troubles associated with the winters in, in Erie are honestly trivial compared with being a Christian in Egypt, where they are considered a despised and a persecuted minority. In addition to the 
the prejudice and the general bias and disdain every now and then. The, the Christians will be scapegoated and blamed for the country's problems, and there will be riots, and crowds will burn down Christian churches, and Christians will be killed. It's, it's a dangerous and difficult life to be a Christian in, in Egypt. Well, Vashti, the, the, the bank teller, had a small cross tattooed on her wrist. You, you see, there was a time when Coptic Christians, considered to be socially undesirable, were forced to pay a special tax. And they were tattooed with a small cross on their right hand or, or, or wrist for identification purposes. It was meant as a public symbol of shame and ostracism, and you don't want to give those people a job. You know what they are. They're, they're Christians. Well, the tax is, is now illegal in Egypt, but Coptic Christians have proudly adopted the cross tattoo as, as a permanent and a, a public sign of their history and allegiance to Christ. In the face of still ongoing persecution, the cross reminds them of who they are and whose they are. Now, in some countries, there are strict religious rules about touching trash or, or garbage. And so the job of garbage collector often falls to the, the hated minorities who are looked down on and shunned by everyone else. In Egypt, these least desirable members of society include, of course, the Christians. In Cairo, a very poor Christian man was sorting through mountains of garbage when he came across a Rolex watch that had a man's name engraved on the back. Uh, this watch was worth many years' wages to this poor man. I mean, it would have provided him with so many comforts that he couldn't afford. But because he was a follower of Jesus, he just felt compelled to try to get it back to the man who, who had lost it. And eventually, he was able to track him down. He was a, a wealthy businessman who was absolutely dumbfounded when this poor outcast came in and returned the watch to him. He was just shaken, overwhelmed. He was in shock. He had grown up learning to be competitive, watching for every opportunity to snatch somebody else's pizza. And he later told a reporter, I didn't know about Jesus at the time, but I told this guy that because of what you have done, because of your example, I want to learn about this Jesus that you are worshiping. And the businessman began to read the New Testament and, and tried to live by its values. Eventually, he and his wife gave their lives to Christ. In 1978, he was ordained by the Coptic Orthodox Church. And now, he and his wife lead a ministry to the poor of Cairo. The Christian garbage collector's eternal impact wasn't based on one lucky good decision. It flowed from years of storing up Jesus' word and his spirit and his character within his heart. And when the time came to choose between being selfish or being true to what he felt Jesus wanted him to do, the man's choice changed the lives of the businessmen and, and his wife, and, and through them, all of the people down through the years who will be impacted by their ministry. Who knows how far this man's influence will go? Who knows how many people will be spiritually fed 
by the fruit that his life has produced. You know, conversion, our commitment to Christ, is it's not a one and done choice that we, we, we made when we were 13 years old. Rather, it is a daily decision to follow Jesus. It's a daily commitment to do the right thing and to bear good fruit. Amen.